Music is an art that comes to life in sounds and silence. Its essence is a note of a certain pitch, duration, volume and color. When a number of successive notes are connected, we create a melody in which sounds are related to each other in terms of distance, tempo, dynamics, timbre and agogics. When notes resonate simultaneously, intervals, chords and clusters emerge. And when chords are connected, harmonies arise. Music is an organized succession of notes and or harmonies. This is what music is from the technical point of view. But how do we perceive music? How does it affect us? What can music teach us? How can it improve our quality of life and enhance our per perception of the world and people around us? Does it have the power to help us understand ourselves and others and make us susceptible to the transcendental? With this lecture, I'll try to give you some ideas concerning these questions, and I hope you could find some answers as well. It is impossible to hold music still even for a moment, to distance yourself from it and continue with it afterwards. It is impossible to create, sing or experience it in the same way more than once. Its being is ceaselessly connected with, some, with time as neither the artist nor the experiencer can feel and be quite the same at the moment of the performance than at any other given moment in time. Since its beginnings, music has always been an acoustic matter transmitted orally from one to another. It had to be kept in constant motion so as not to die. In order to survive, music needed a medium to keep it alive, and so used humans. Many objects and architectural remains from a distant past have been preserved to this day without anyone's help. Music, however, could not be preserved in any other way than orally until it was discovered how to write it down for the first time. Save in the shelter of its mother's body, an unborn child cannot see, smell or taste, but it can hear muted sounds of the outside world, make out a difference between a man's and woman's voice, and even remember a melody heard more than once. When a child is born, it recognizes the voices of its mother and father. Even though physical contact between a baby and its mother is of utmost importance, a baby's voice is its most important means of expression as it uses it to communicate with its environment in the first days of its life. <coughs> a baby uses crying to tell the world that something is not as it should be that it needs something. It responds to sounds coming from the surrounding environment from the outset. A child reacts to loud sounds from the environment by crying and being restless. It gradually learns to recognize different sounds and ascribe dif different meanings to them. It gradually learns to recognize different sounds. <coughs> I read it already. From the first day onwards, a newborn starts learning how to differentiate between different shades of emotions in the voice of its parents. A baby develops an increased sensitivity to different meaning of melody of sound, articulation and changes in dynamics. In this way, it not only shapes its world of meanings, but also its world of emotions and senses. Hearing is one of the five basic human senses used to perceive the world around us and to communicate with others. It is the first sense to come alive and the last one to die. It is active even when a person is asleep and serves as a kind of sensor warning us about the goings-on outside our field of vision. 
An average person can hear sounds between 16 and 20,000 Hz. Some animals can hear sounds about 20,000 Hz. We call it ultrasound. Humans cannot hear sounds below frequency of 16 Hz, but we can feel them. This is called infrasound and it is produced during thunderstorms, earthquakes and by extremely noisy machines. If exposed to infrasound for too long, it can harm us, since extremely low frequencies strong, strongly affects our well-being. Regardless of the frequency, a sound must be louder than the audibility threshold if we are to hear it. A healthy person hears sounds that are louder than zero decibels. But when a sound reaches around 120 decibels, we only perceive it as pain and pressure. A person does not perceive sound only with the help of hearing. Since sound is vibration, oscillation, energy, one perceives it in the same way as all other living beings do, with the whole body. That is why it's impossible for us to avoid sound. We can close our eyes and block our nose, but sound reaches into us no matter how hard we plug our ears. And even we are able to mute all external sounds, our inner and intimate sound, sounds such as breathing and beating of our heart would still reach our brain. If a person is deaf since birth, they cannot speak, even if their speech organs are completely healthy. Our acoustic world forms on the basis of what we hear, and if one does not receive that information, they do not have any acoustic samples to imitate. Sounds heard from the environment are prerequisite for the development of speech. Even specific properties of speech, for example, phonetic particularities of languages, develop in a child depending on the kind of sounds they receive from the environment. Even the physiology of a specific voice is shaped on the basis on the basis of the properties of sounds and voice reaching the brain through ears. Speakers of German, for example, have trouble pronouncing the Slovenian sound for rrrr. And Slovenians have trouble pronouncing the German rrrr sound. <laughs> it is perfectly clear that providing a child of Slovenian mother were surrounded by speakers of German, they would have no problems pronouncing the German R sound. It is hard to say how old the idea of music as art is. When did the transformation from simple sounds used for communication to melodies and rhythms that pleased people take place? When did it fascinate a person to such an extent that they went from spontaneous music making to the conscious creation of music and searching for its laws. Early ancient civilizations were already acquainted with music. It is considered to be the first among the arts. There are millennia old Indian Vedic texts talking about it and claiming that all exists in the universe, that all that exists in the universe is a manifestation of vibrations through which spiritual energy is converted into material substance. They also talk about how certain vibrations produced as mantras can affect the human organism and the natural environment that surrounds it. They explain the effects of sound on human emotions and consider music's most important role to be its raising human's consciousness. The ancient Greek, ancient Greek were even more systematic in studying music as they approached it from a philosophic and a scientific point of view. The Pythagoreans, 4th and 5th century before Christ, declared it one of the Septem Artes Liberales, seven free art, with which they educated and trained three Greek boys. 
They divide the tone scales into two groups, depending on their nature. The ones that inspired in people all that is good, Apollonian, and were suitable for education, and the ones that aroused in them unrest, passions, and primal instincts that were associated with the god Dionysus. They were thorough in their research of the educational power of music and were aware of its direct effect on the human soul. They maintained that more than any other form of art, music can make human spirit even more sensitive as well as, as, well as purify and enrich it. They claimed that it plays an important role in shaping a person's aesthetic awareness and nourishing the soul. In The Republic, Plato explains his concept of a perfect state, and I quote, Musical training is a more potent instrument than any other, because rhythm and harmony find their way into the inward places of the soul on which they mightly fasten, imparting grace and making the soul of him who is rightly educated graceful." <coughs> End of quote. Around that hysteria, hysteri historical period, Confucius, an Eastern philosopher, also had similar ideas. He taught that music enriches the soul and promotes virtue. He compared the harmonic order of music with the order of the universe, as well as the order of the society and the state. In the Christian world, music has also been present since the very beginning. It also intrigued Christian thinkers to such an extent that they wanted to find out where it had come from and why it had such a strong effect on them. Saint Augustine even reprimanded himself for sinning. I quote, When I find the singing itself more moving than the truth which it conveys, although he was aware that when they are sung, the sacred words stir my mind to greater, greater religious fervor and kindle in me a more ardent form of piety than they would if they were not sung. And I also know that there are particular modes in song and voice corresponding to my various emotions and able to stimulate them because of some mysterious relationship between the two." End of quote. In contemporary world, we are again discovering the importance of music for humans. Alternative medicine, for example, uses sound therapy using gongs and sound massages with bowls. These approaches make use of vibrations, the physical component of music. Even orthodox medicine is making use of very various methods of treatment using sounds. For example, usage of ultra ultrasound for diagnostics and therapy. Therapy using music is becoming increasingly popular as music and bioresonance therapies are gaining more and more ground. That is nothing unusual or spiritistic. If we have doubts about Plato and the ancient philosophers who spoke about the effect of music on humans millennia ago, then contemporary science has shown us in various ways that invisible and intangible sound nevertheless does present a real energy that has an effect on a person and can change them. A French otolaryngologist and inventor, Alfred Tomatis, studied the effect on classical music on human health and learning. Through research, he discovered that sounds affect our cells, tissues and organs. The oscillation of sound creates patterns, energy fields and resonances that are absorbed by our bodies and cause subtle changes to our breathing heartbeat, <coughs> blood pressure, muscle tension and skin temperature and in this way affect our health and learning ability. Our brain links, to sound, links sounds to particular emotions and feelings. 
they have the ability to remember these connections and recall them time and again. Music and its vibrations trigger certain chemical processes in our bodies. When we listen to pleasant music, the pituitary gland releases endorphins that function as endogenous opioids. This improves a person's physiological state as they create a feeling of happiness and satisfaction. Scientists have discovered that nerve stimuli that result from sound waves bypass brain centers connected with conscious decision making and travel directly to the unconscious part connected with experience. Music is perceived by the part of the brain that is responsible for direct perception, experience and feeling. Sound travels to the amygdala, the part of the brain that processes our emotions and keeps them in our memory. That is why we find some sounds pleasant, while others give us goosebumps or make us break out in a sweat. Although music is purely physical in nature, it reaches into the very center of our being. Every sound, word and piece of music that reaches our ears marks and shapes us. Nothing remains purely on a rational level, but it is consciously or unconsciously processed and reflected on a physical, emotional and spiritual level. As Alinka Rebula, Slovenia, Slovenian poet and writer, writes in her article, we are of the same material as the voice, I quote, to listen means that we let sound mold us like soft clay. And then we are no longer what we were. We should be careful what we listen to, because that is what we are becoming. And be careful how we speak, because our voice travels directly into a person's heart. After hearing something, we are never the same as we were before. End of quote. With its emotional and spiritual dimension and its substance, what we hear constantly changes us. We should therefore be even more sensitive and vigilant about what kind of sounds, voices and music our children are exposed to at their gentler stage, when they cannot run away from an unpleasant sound environment on their own. That is the period when the outline of the emotional words is being formed. And this outline is the basis for the formation of their identity and for all their subsequent connections, reactions and relationships with people and the world. When I ruminate about the importance of music in the education of our children, or rather about what kind of role it could have, I keep returning to the thought about how young people today are supposed to make out the sounds that are important for them, of all that noise of the modern world surrounding them. And how can they make out their inner or God's voice in all this noise? Had it not been easier for my generation or the generation of my parents, we have grown accustomed to noise being commonplace. Technological development and an increased pace of life have made us insensitive to ever-present noise. Our tolerance for sounds, sound has increased drastically. It would be interesting to measure how much the volume of sounds had increased in the past, for example, 100 years. I'm not talking here about the sounds that are a result of natural phenomena. I'm thinking of the world of artificial sounds resulting from technology, economy and transportation. And I'm appalled. How can a child cope in such a world where they are constantly bombarded with sounds? A baby that is used to the gentle, muted sounds that, experienced, that it experienced in its mother's body 
winces at every sudden loud sound, or it's frightened and begins to cry. But it gradually becomes used to the constantly receiving sound stimuli. A child's resistance to noise increases quite incredibly as it grows up. <laughs> However, being exposed to too many loud sounds on a daily basis leaves consequences. A child becomes less sensitive to sounds and requires stronger and stronger impulses to take notice. A key role is also played by the modern technology's accessories, which our children and teenagers are very familiar with. Let's take cartoons into consideration. In the ones intended for the youngest children, pictures and scenes should change slowly. The pictures should be nice, the voice pleasant and the music happy. Unfortunately, even cartoons have changed. Scenes change rapidly. The volume is high and the sound effects are unusual. All this provokes unrest, confusion and tension in a child as they cannot process information so quickly, not even on, on a rational level, let alone on an emotional and experiential level. Besides, a child's perception is superficial and without a real sense for detail and nuanced diversity. A deeper experience and evaluation of what is perceived is not possible. This results in passive, emotionally and spiritually lethargic, lethargic young people who need extreme stimuli to be aroused. In constant daily rush, a child has very few opportunities to stop and calm down without being haunted by the thought that they must do something, learn something or prove themselves to someone. Musical education could be a place where a child calms <coughs> down and concentrates on only one thing at once. Where they can learn to focus themselves and their own, on their own perception, <coughs> learn how to be still in silence, where they could hear, feel, evaluate, express. Unfortunately, because of the necessity for a numerical evaluation of knowledge, so many undisciplined, undisciplined children and poorly trained teachers, music in primary school became just another primary school subject and it's not educational in nature anymore. Pupils must learn a great deal about history, morphology and music theory, so there is often not enough time for even a small amount of musical creativity. Yet, some music teachers have enough enthusiasm and ingenuity to succeed in making room for creative music making alongside all the other curriculum material. When I was teaching music at Gymnasia Litia Secondary School, I talked with pupils about the meaning of music in their lives. We discovered that 99% of young people listen to music for at least a few hours every day. We saw how music affects them by the way they dressed, thought, spoke and behaved. Most of them admitted that music played an important role in their lives and that it accompanied them everywhere they went, mainly just as an acoustic background, you know, earplugs, but also as a friend in difficult moments, as a means for making contact with others, as an aid in finding their identity and as a mean of expression. They discovered that they cannot imagine life without it, and that it is possible to use the power of music in various ways, including the negative manipulation of individuals and masses. If society and those responsible for education were truly aware of this, they would not turn music as a school subject into a science or history about music, but they would develop a program in which children would sing, play and dance. At the school where I've been teaching choral singing for the past 20 years, 
music and especially choral singing is held as a true value. The Diocesan Classical Gymnasium is a private secondary school with a four-year program based on the general secondary school module. A special feature of the curriculum is the subject religion and culture that is not offered at public secondary schools in Slovenia. The school is attended by pupils aged between 15 and 19 who have successfully completed nine years of primary school education. After having been closed for 50 years due to the communist regime, the school was reopened in 1993. It was the wish of the school's founder, Archbishop Aloysi Schuster, that music should have a special place in the institution. The first music professor, composer and conductor, Damian Mochnik, envisioned a variety of musical activities that eventually grew to become an astonishingly lively body of choirs that is considered to be exceptional on the Slovenian as well as European levels. Special attention is paid towards providing musical activities of high quality to include as many pupils as possible. Almost all pupils are involved in various musical activities. About half of all the 600 pupils participate in the musical activities more actively by singing in school choirs or playing in the orchestra. Before we see how choral singing is organized at our school, I would like to show you the video of one of our school choirs. It is the choir where my uh, former singer used to sing, Emma.
There are five active choirs at our school which differ in the age of participating pupils, pupils the maturity and capability of their voices, as well as in style and the difficulty of the musical repertoire. At the beginning of school year, all first year, pu first year pupils are tested for singers, for singing ability, and those that pass the test then join either the boys or the girls' first year choirs. In the two choirs, studying a suitable repertoire helps them develop a love for choral singing. They learn vocal technique basics, basics and the fundamental skills necessary for good and healthy choral singing. At the end of school year, all pupils who have sung in the first year's choir audition for one of the chamber choirs, girls' choir or the mixed choir. The two consists of second to fourth year pupils singing a more demanding choral repertoire. Each of the singers also has a 10-minute individual vocal technique lesson per week. The choirs carry out performances in Slovenia as well as abroad and constantly achieve top results in competitions. They also present an important factor in the shaping of Slovenia and European youth choir scenes. <coughs> The fifth and most recent of the school's choirs is another mixed choir that came about as a result of proposal made by boys and girls who did not want to or could not join one of the two chamber choirs, but nevertheless wanted to continue singing after the first year. This choir has the most members and its repertoire includes mainly gospel and pop music. Encouraged by the school class choir singing festival, pupils also organize, them, organize themselves into class choirs. At last year's festival, class choir, fe at last year's festival, 19 out of 20 classes competed for the title of the best class choir. Pupils prepare for their performances on their own. They are the ones who choose the program in their own arrangements and create and perform the musical accompaniment. At the festival, one can hear a variety of high-quality, inventive polyphonic choral performances. Pupils also form smaller vocal and instrumental groups of their own accord, and some of them continue to exist and become an active part of the Slovenian music scene after pupils leave the school. After completing their education at the Diocesan Secondary School, former pupils can join one of the alumni choirs, Migaron Chamber Choir or Women's Choir, means Sonora. <coughs> the Aloysi Schuster Primary School that opened its doors within the St. Stanislav's institution seven years ago is introducing a similar form of organization. In the first three years, all pupils sing in class choirs. Choral singing lessons are carried out twice a week by a singer, singing teacher and are a part of regular school curriculum. In years four to nine, pupils can join either a children's choir or later a youth choir. Additionally, there is a music school in the St. Stanislaus institution where pupils of primary school and, and the gymnasium have the possibility to learn to play 11 different instruments or take solo, voice or jazz singing lessons. Our former pupils, singers, later join adult choirs or even lead choirs themselves, while some go on to study music, like Emma, for example. This is how aspirations of our institution come to life and help influence the development of Slovenian choral singing, which is, with its 64,000 singers, the most widespread amateur cultural activity in Slovenia, and according to recent studies, one of the most eminent ones in the world. I've been noticing 
that the young are less and less willing to work hard towards a long-term goal. Accustomed to the greed of today's world, they want quick results. That is why long-term fidelity to a group or activity is usually an exception rather than a rule. Young people who go, young people go where they feel best in a particular moment or when they have time and where they will be able to achieve a quick result and enjoy it immediately. Singing in a choir does not work like that. Conductors want reliable singers who are sometimes willing to sacrifice their other responsibilities for the sake of the choir. Our task is to teach them to persevere and work hard for the common cause. <coughs> the young are quick to understand when a certain matter is a joke and then thing, when things get serious. Since they generally join choirs voluntarily, they are more prepared to invest into the activity than they would be were they forced to participate in it. When they are thrilled, they like working hard. They are critical and wish to know when they are doing something right as well when they are doing something wrong and how to achieve better results. They desired, desire exquisiteness and when they trust their leader, they dare to explore the unknown. Their perception and experience of aesthetic is ineluctably connected with the perception of their own being, with a realization about their own value and beauty, and with allowing oneself to essentially be wholesome and sincere. Unfortunately, external life and contemporary idols too often demand different feelings. It is the duty of us teachers to offer them something better. We must be convinced and convincing. The young want to see and feel their teachers like and respect them, that they love their wor work and that they are sincere in doing it. That is when they can be molded and become ready to make sacrifices. They need a strong leader to motivate, challenge and inspire them. This is how mutual trust is formed that lays an excellent foundation for creative work where each and everyone is capable of giving their best at exactly the right moment. Whenever to listen, we listen to a concert, we want singers on stage to be happy and smiling as this makes an audience feel safe and relaxed. Such a performance makes singing look easy and singers look as if their sole purpose is to enjoy themselves. Anyone who has ever sung in a choir, and especially us, the conductors, knows know just how much practice is needed for such a performance. How many skills must one master and coalesce in order for the choir to breathe as one harmonious and serene musical instrument. It is of course wonderful if a piece of music is sung perfectly in tune, rhythmically correctly, with a beautiful sound and stylistically appropriately. Nevertheless, this should not be our goal, but merely the method. More important than vocal skills is what happens within a singer during singing. The steps they are making when opening up when they are leaving a room and freeing themselves of physical and mental frustrations, when they are being liberated from their fears about the thoughts of others about them, when they once again learn about the lost authenticity and spontaneity of expression, experience as well as perception of their own body, when they learn to perform in public and wish to show the best they can technically and musically while remaining at ease and genuine. All this enables a singer to grow. During rehearsals, 
After a certain time, a singer relaxes and leaves behind their worries. Physical activity during singing, from diaphragmatic breathing and the usage of voice onwards, affects singers' general well-being and with it their help. Deep diaphragmatic breathing calms one's heartbeat, improves circulation and massages inner organs, and therefore rejuvenates the whole body. All this reduces stress, strengthens immune system and helps brain function better. Eric Jensen, in his work Music with the Brain in Mind, claims that being actively involved in music helps improve learning proficiency as it stimulates a person's perceptive, cognitive, emotional, motoric and other neurobiological systems that are fundamental for learning. While making music, neuron connections between the left and right sides of the brain are right stimulated. The same thing happens, but to a lesser extent, when one listens to music. The level of creativity increases, memory improves, as do spatial and mathematical capabilities. A singer's capacity for concentration improves and grows if the singer is regularly involved in music. While singing, we have to think of many different things at once. Correct intonation, rhythm, word, words, sharp pronunciation, aesthetic production of notes, phrasing, facial expre expressions and postures, harmoniousness with the others, attentiveness to other singers and the conductor, and much more. This improves our attention span as well as the capability of focusing on more than one thing at once and the harmonic synchron synchronized functioning of different physical, mental and emotional processes. All this not only has positive effect in the field of music but in many other fields as well. Choral singing is like long-distance running. There is no quick personal, let alone group progress. If a singer wants to be an equal member of a group, they must attend rehearsals regularly and on time. They must take care of their health and treat their voice responsibly, not only when singing, but also during other activities. They must often defeat tiredness, laziness and absence of mind. During rehearsals, they must precisely follow conductor's instructions, limit their verbal communication with other singers and abstain from music communication devices. They often have to neglect their personal wants and needs for the sake of the group. Long-term perseverance in such an activity teaches singers loyalty and shows them that success requires much self-restraint and persistence. Choral singers are constantly dependent on someone, be it themselves or other singers or the conductor. This results in intense interactions that enable the development of social skills. Communication between singers takes take place on different levels. A sense of empathy enables members of a choir to help each other in a technical, musical and emotional sense. For example, a singer learns to be considerate towards other singers to such an extent that they are able to feel when their neighbour will run out of breath so they will be able to carry on with the phrase when their neighbour fails to do so. Mutual tolerance, patience in relationships, accepting differences, accepting better and worse singers, experiencing, experiencing success and failures, mutual trust and performing in public are only some of the challenges encountered by a choral singer. At the same time, they must face their own feelings which arise as a reaction to the community they are a part of. 
understand them, evaluate them, know how to control them, and essentially also express them. Singers hone their skills alongside each other and strengthen their positive self-image while asserting themselves within the group. They enter a choir within, with different dispositions, expectations and reasons. Some are drawn by their love of singing, others because of company, and others again to spend quality free time. What they all have in common is the positive feeling about being within a group. The sense of teamwork is a singer's key virtue that can only develop as a consequence of understanding oneself as an individual as well as as a part of a group. An individual is very important within a choir, but only as much as they are capable of being an integral part of a group, adjust to it and nonetheless keep their own integrity. Every artist is a seeker. The ability to create a work of art is a gift an artist earns with hard work. But one cannot create a true masterpiece unless they allow themselves to be inspired. Music that speaks on its own and is its own artist is divine and God-sent. Even though an artist may transform a piece of music into writing and save it from eternal oblivion, the creation is yet dead to the world. It is like a concealed talent just waiting to be shared so it can proliferate and grow in all its grandeur. For a piece of art to become alive, it needs vulnerable artists to find in it something more than sole technical perfection. It needs an artist who can wholeheartedly dive into it and at the moment of artistic creation touch upon eternity. <coughs> Only then a piece of art rises about beautiful words and harmony of sounds. It becomes transcendental. A singer a musician with all their being focused on substance and matter forgets about themselves. They become what they sing. They become one with the song, with other singers and the conductor. When they expand about the technique, they let their soul sink through the beauty of their face and serenity of the body. In that moment, purely focused bodily and spiritual being makes way for an essence no earthly force is able to explain. Such perfect harmony most often occurs in concert or during liturg liturgical singing when the public is also present in the same blessed time and space. When singers break the silence and pour the serene spirit of a community onto God, their hearts beat and sound the same with the audience. They become one body and one spirit united in God from whom a piece of art springs and to whom rightfully returns. It is only then that a work of art is realized in the fullness of its luminance and the essence of its voice is achieved. It is in this way that God communicates with humans through the language of music. Now I will read you the testimony of our former pupil and singer Blaska Bogatai. Um, he sang Bruckner's Stadium, and this testimony speaks about it. Backstage, we are getting in line for Bruckner's Stadium, our great and great hope. 
Out of all the effort and love put into it, the best possible outcome must emerge. As Professor Foykar said during our joint rehearsals, one plus one is not two, it is ten. We are on. Before I realize it, I am standing in front of a packed hall and am trembling, but only for a moment. When the conductor, Professor Mochnik, raises his hand and the orchestra plays its first note, there is no one there anymore. Only the conductor, his hands, actually his whole body and face. There are only beginnings, notes, articulation, dynamics. This is the present, the past and the future. As though we have only ever, be wa ever been waiting for this moment. We did not take our eyes off the conductor's hand or our scores. Our attention was undivided. The energy that held us together and guided us is indescribably great. It must be experienced. It is something infinite, amazing, mighty and beautiful that touches you, cradles you and completely overcomes you. The force of life. Music, singing, being one. It is hard to put all this into words, but my experience was completely unforgettable. You are hit by a wave and you are no longer you. You are a note, a melody, a part of this infinite whole and perfection. So small. And yet, it is precisely your place. And the gratitude you feel for having found yourself is boundless. Everything flows so beautifully. And, of, and all of a sudden, you find yourself singing the last bar and you are as happy as can be, filled with an unknown grace and a little sorry that it is over. But you are happy that it happened and that there is all this energy in this final court into which you place the last morsels of your soul and your strength. The final flourish of the conductor's hand, silence in the hall, and the tingling of the whole body and the soul. Then the conductor raises his hands and thanks us. I feel like I, I could burst from so many wonderful feelings that words cannot describe. One plus one is more than could ever be counted, measured or put into words. It is simply infinite. What can I say? Thank you. <laughs> the applause broke out. And now we will listen to a few seconds of the very dead performance. Music is the universal language of creation. It does not need an explanation or a translation since it speaks directly to us. A person understands it no matter what religious, cultural or social background they came, come from, no matter how old they are or how well read they are. Music, music affects a person on a physical level and at the same time directs thoughts and creates new connections in the brain. It sharpens one's perception of oneself, another and the surrounding world. It promotes acceptance and evaluation of one's own feelings and emotions. And with it, the loving attitudes towards oneself and another. It reaches into the depths of soul and prepares it for the transcendental. 
Being musically active improves work habits, teaches discipline and creative coexistence. It stimulates our zest for life and enables us to fully experience personal growth within a community. It allows the young and children to gain, I quote, skills and knowledge that will be of a help in various everyday situations within a safe interest group and forms those attitudes and habits that are required for the responsible assumption of duties in life. End of quote. Musical education helps a child and the young person achieve a comprehensive emotional, cognitive, psychomotor, social and spiritual development. I dare say that systematic musical and singing education contributes, contributes substantially to the ethical and spiritual and indirectly also the social and economic progress of a society. Can we make use of this realization in Slovenia and elsewhere? Thank you very much for your patience. I hope you can make use of what you heard. Thank you very much. <laughs>